Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to talk here about the metabolism of two amino acids, phenylalanine and tyrosine. Now, when you hear those amino acids, you probably think, well, those aren't really important because I don't know what they do. And the fact of the matter is, these are very important amino acids. They are precursors to a lot of different things in the body. And it's got a pathway that is very heavily tested on the USMLE. And the reason it's very heavily tested is that there are a lot of clinical disorders that involve this pathway. And so because there are a lot of clinical disorders, they can give you vignettes and then they can turn it into a biochemistry question where they ask you what enzyme is deficient or what products are going to be elevated because of an enzyme being deficient. So you really do have to know this pathway. And I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple for you. Uh, hopefully we can get through this in about 13 or 14 minutes. So let's go ahead and start. We're going to start out with the amino acid phenylalanine. And phenylalanine is an essential amino acid. And it's essential because it is the basis of the metabolism of or the creation of tyrosine, which is important for a lot of different processes. So phenylalanine, we have that, and the enzyme that converts phenylalanine to tyrosine, which is right here, is called phenylalanine hydroxylase. Okay, so we're converting it into tyrosine. Now, phenylalanine hydroxylase uses a cofactor, a very special cofactor, and this cofactor is called tetrahydrobiopterin. And we're just going to write that as BH4. Now, when BH4 interacts with the phenylalanine hydroxylase, it gives off two H's and it becomes BH2. So it's a necessary cofactor that uh, interacts with this enzyme and allows phenylalanine to become tyrosine. Now, we need tetrahydrobiopterin, or BH4, otherwise we can't do this reaction. But when we use BH4, we get BH2, and somehow we need to get that back to BH4. And so we can do that by using NADPH. NADPH shows up in a lot of places in biochemistry, and this is one of them. So NADPH will donate electrons to BH2 and replenish BH4. And so in doing so, NADPH becomes NADP. And there's actually a special enzyme that catalyzes this process, this donation of electrons to BH4, and it's aptly named dihydrobiopterin reductase because we're reducing BH2 to BH4. And this enzyme is going to be important uh, when it comes to a disease, so we'll come back to that. Okay, so now we have tyrosine. What can tyrosine do? Well, for one, tyrosine is used to make thyroglobulins, and that is important for thyroid hormone production. So it goes to thyroglobulins. And remember that when we're making thyroid hormone, and we're not going to talk about this in too much detail, but remember that you have those MITs and DITs. Well, all that stands for is monoiodotyrosine and diiodotyrosine. So if we have an MIT and a DIT that combine, that gives us T3. And if we have two DITs, that gives us T4. Remember that with our thyroid hormone synthesis? So that uses tyrosine. Another thing that tyrosine can do is it can start the process of catecholamine synthesis. So in order to do this, tyrosine needs to be reduced, and it uses the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase. So we're hydroxylizing tyrosine, and that makes levodopa. And that sounds familiar, right? Because that's part of catecholamine synthesis. So in order to do that, it does the exact same thing as phenylalanine hydroxylase. It uses BH4. And this also is going to, I, I didn't draw it on here, but this also is going to use dihydrobiopterin reductase. 
this should be a B here. Okay, DHPR is a totally different enzyme. So DHBR. So it uses the same process. So I'll just write DHBR here. And of course that uses NADPH as well. Now DOPA will then can go in a couple different ways. DOPA, of course, can go to catecholamine synthesis, and we're not going to go over that pathway here, uh, but suffice it to say it does go into catecholamine synthesis. And it can also be converted to melanin. And that is through an enzyme called tyrosinase. Okay, tyrosinase. Now this uses a cofactor, and that cofactor is copper. Okay, so what else can tyrosine do? Well, tyrosine can get converted through a few different enzymes into a compound, compound called homogentisate, also known as homogentisic acid. So homogentisate. You don't need to know the enzymes between tyrosine and homogentisate or homogentisic acid. Just know that it, it happens. So now we've got homogentisate, and homogentisate then gets converted to a big long name, malleal acetoacetate. Now, the important part is that you know that there is an enzyme that catalyzes this process, and that enzyme is called homogentisate oxidase. Homogentisate oxidase. We can just write that as HGO. Okay, and then malleal acetoacetate gets converted to fumaryl acetoacetate. You don't need to know the enzyme for that, just know it happens. And then there's an enzyme called FAA or fumaryl acetoacetate hydroxylase. And that cleaves fumaryl acetoacetate into fumarate, which goes into the TCA cycle, as we know, and acetoacetate. Okay, so that is our entire pathway. Now, where are the problems that can go on here? Pretty much every step, <laughs> and that's why this is so heavily tested. So first of all, deficiency of phenylalanine, phenylalanyl hydroxylase, phenylalanine hydroxylase. That causes classic PKU. This is most likely the way PKU is going to be given to you. And so what happens is you have an accumulation of phenylalanine. You can't make tyrosine. And so uh, you have to get tyrosine in your diet. Fortunately, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, but you can't biosynthesize tyrosine. So tyrosine then becomes an essential amino acid. Another way that you can get PKU is if this dihydrobiopterin reductase is deficient or not working properly. And so that's a PKU called malignant PKU. And this is a much worse form because not only does it cause PKU because phenylalanine builds up, but the tyrosine that you do get in your diet is not going to be able to be converted into DOPA and then go on to make uh, catecholamines. So the result is that you're going to have a deficiency of dopamine. And so uh, that causes other problems, more severe neurologic issues. Another area where this can become a problem is if you have a deficiency of tyrosinase, and that causes one form of oculocutaneous albinism. We're not making melanin. Next, we can have a deficiency of homogentisate oxidase. This causes something special called alcaptonuria. And that is that disorder that causes that blue discoloration, uh, which is called ochronosis. 
And then one more disease that's not heavily tested, but it can come up um, in a very simple way, is something called tyrosinemia. And tyrosinemia can happen due to deficiency of a variety of enzymes, one of them being FAA hydroxylase. What I want you to know, we're not going to go into tyrosinemia in detail here, but a way that tyrosinemia shows up and it's a dead giveaway is that they'll say that the patient has a cabbage-like odor. So if you ever hear cabbage-like odor, think tyrosinemia. That's all you need to know about that because if you do get a question on tyrosinemia, uh, they're going to tell you a cabbage-like odor. So that's all you need to know about that. Okay, so let's talk about the disorders of phenylalanine tyrosine metabolism. So we talked about classic PKU, and just by the way, all of these are disorders of metabolism, so you can bet that they're all going to be autosomal recessive. So classic PKU, the enzyme is phenylalanine, phenylalanine hydroxylase, which is phenylalanine to tyrosine. And the typical symptom of PKU is that the patient has a musty body odor. So that's what you need to remember with PKU, musty body odor. They will get neurologic deficits, and those can include seizures, intellectual disability, they get growth retardation, and importantly, a fair complexion. And why is that? Because phenylalanine will get converted or should get converted to tyrosine, which is ultimately a precursor for melanin. So they won't be synthesizing quite as much melanin, and so they'll tend to have a fairer complexion, but they won't be albino. Uh, what do you have for labs? Well, just think of this, this pathway. Where's the block? It's phenylalanine to tyrosine. So you're going to have a buildup of phenylalanine, and you're going to have low levels of tyrosine. Because phenylalanine builds up, it will get converted into other byproducts, and one of those being phenylketones. And that makes sense, right? It's called phenylketonuria, phenylketones in the urine. So to treat this, we restrict phenylalanine. And if you do that, uh, you're, you're pretty much good to go. Uh, the only other thing is that you have to get tyrosine in the diet because you have no way of biosynthesizing it. So you'll need to give tyrosine supplements. We also get give tetrahydrobiopterin supplements, and that's just because with any of these errors of metabolism, you do have a little bit of enzyme, so you want to make as best use of that as possible, so we need to make sure we give the cofactor. And of course, famously, you need to avoid aspartame, which is a, an artificial sweetener because that contains phenylalanine. Tetrahydrobiopterin deficiency or malignant PKU pretty much looks the exact same as PKU. The only difference is that you have more severe symptoms. And another thing is that you'll tend to have low dopamine. And remember, the reason for that is that dopamine is also formed in that it requires tetrahydrobiopterin. So you'll tend to have a low level of dopamine. And that's probably what's behind some of the more severe neurologic uh, issues. Uh, and so because of the fact that you have low dopamine, remember the other name for dopamine is prolactin inhibitory factor. So if you have low prolactin inhibitory factor, you're going to have high prolactin. So that's something that may show up is that you've got a patient with typical PKU symptoms, but they have a high prolactin. And so they may give you phenylalanine, phenylalanine hydroxylase as a answer choice, and then they may give you tetrahydrobiopterin reductase as a choice, and you need to pick tetrahydrobiopterin reductase because classic PKU does not cause you to have a low dopamine and a high prolactin. Treatment here is pretty much the same, except there's a greater emphasis on giving those BH4 supplements. Oculocutaneous albinism, this is type 1, uh, it's the tyrosinase deficiency. This is the second most common cause of oculocutaneous albinism. Symptoms, you know an albino when you see one, right? They've got very fair skin, white hair. They tend to have visual problems. Really no labs here because it's very clinically evident. Um, so you're probably not going to give be given any labs uh, with, with this one. The treatment here is really just uh, symptomatic UV protection, uh, primarily because their lack of melanin puts them at risk for uh, skin cancer. 
And then now Captain Uria, this has got a pretty dramatic presentation and a pretty unique presentation. So you should be able to nail these questions. They likely won't ask you for the diagnosis. They're likely going to ask you about the enzyme or about uh, the treatment. So the enzyme is homogentisate oxidase. The symptoms, uh, they accumulate this homogentisic acid in their connective tissue, so they get joint pain, they get blue discoloration or ochronosis, and then because it can accumulate in the urine, the urine will come out straw colored as it usually does, but then when you expose it to oxygen, it will start to turn this sort of inky blue color, uh, and so that may be given to you. Uh, you're going to have, obviously, an elevation of homogentisate and then the characteristic urine color. And the treatment here is dietary restriction of both phenylalanine and tyrosine because those are upstream of homogentisate. So here's just a picture of oculocutaneous albinism. You can notice here that this little girl has very fair skin and uh, practically white hair. You can even see her very light colored eyelashes. And then this is alcaptinuria, and this is the natural progression of alcaptinuria. Uh, notice here that you have blue discoloration of the sclera. Don't jump to something else you might be thinking of when you hear blue discoloration of the sclera. It's not always osteogenesis imperfecta, um, but you also see blue discoloration of the connective tissue. And notice that this occurs over time and it gets worse and worse and worse. And these patients also have very debilitating joint pain. And that's it.